I've gone and made the mistake of learning through trial and error before, and it costs a whole lot more. It's a lot more painful. I want to meet the people that have already been there, done that, made the mistakes and learn from their battle scars as opposed to having to get my battle scars. And so to your point, like synergy is a really important factor there because if we're going to go and do that, we need to have something of value to provide to those people, right? It can't just be a one-way exchange. So I think I personally am always looking for people that we can learn from and then, hey, how can we provide value to them? Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 382. How does the landscape look for real estate investors in 2023? My guests today share the belief that no matter what's going on in the economy, real estate investing is the tried and true method of building wealth and cash flow. Riley Oikel invests in small and large multifamily properties for long, mid, and short-term rentals. And James Fedick is a short-term rental consultant to Robert Kiyosaki, and he's also the co-author of Airbnb for Dummies. Riley and James, welcome to the show. Thanks, Riley. Thanks for having us. Why don't we just start with each of you telling us a little bit about your background and how you got started investing in, in real estate. Riley, why don't we start with you? I would say my background, looking back on the journey, would be when I started off. I actually knew someone that was in kind of like my network, let's say, in, in Ontario here, and he had owned one of Southwestern Ontario's privately owned portfolios. So he had quite a few properties under his name. And he was looking for a right-hand man, someone that could help him out with the business and kind of duplicate his efforts. I was fortunate enough to be re really put under his wing, I like to say. He took me took me under his wing and, and taught me everything around analysis and deal acquisition, finding off-market deals and doing the reno management, the property management. I probably rented about two, 200 plus units over the, the course of a few years and then did a bit of his financial management too at the end of the day. So, so I had a, a good kind of experience there over, over the, the first few years, really got my, my foot in the door and was able to get into rooms with real estate investors that I probably shouldn't have been able to get into rooms with at a young age and my net worth. And so I, I was learning about like university level real estate investing before I ever learned about like grade one. So it was pretty complex stuff. Like we were learning about building subdivisions and, and, and apartment buildings and like doing crazy conversions, buying a single and turning it into a four unit. And so all these cool things. And so it took me a little while to figure it all out and, and to go back to grade one, but I ultimately did online and, and learned and did a bunch of coaching programs and bought, bought a few properties and then started up my own real estate investing company. And we started buying a, 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 quite a few multifamily properties in Southwestern Ontario, did the burr on all of them. And it was all creative financing. So I started when I was 21 and really just had no money to my name. So we, we started doing it with joint ventures, mainly in vendor take back mortgages, built up a, a good portfolio. And then James and I, we, we knew each other from a different different business and ended up working together on um, on a short-term rental property. So we ended up buying, buying a few short-term rentals. And then we started helping other people to do the same. Riley, I, I want to follow up on one thing you said there. So you started under the the kind of the mentorship of this experienced real estate investor when you were in your early 20s or late teens? Early 20s, yeah. And how did you land that position? Like, how were you able to impress this person that they should hire you? It's kind of interesting. So we we both had worked at a corporation beforehand. It was like a company that essentially helped like university students to run businesses. So he was the vice president for multiple years. And I would see him come in every single year to speak in front of the group and knew a bit about his background. And I guess he knew a bit about me too. And just me having worked at that company was like that extra little bit of credibility and trust as well. And so when I had reached out and said, Hey, I'm looking to learn this. He was just, it was just a total coincidence. He was also looking for extra help at the time. And his previous right-hand man had just left to do his own, his own kind of business. And so, uh, yeah, he basically took me on full time and did that for a few years. So. I think it was it was again because of our backgrounds they had overlapped pr prior to and I didn't just reach out and cold call them or anything. We kind of had somewhat of a relationship prior to. Yeah. 
James, tell us about yourself. How did you get started investing in real estate? My journey with real estate is I actually didn't didn't start with investing. I started with managing other people's properties on Airbnb. So that was a business that we that we started up in Toronto here. We saw a need for people to, to have property managers managing specifically short-term rentals. So we, we started helping some property owners do that and grew to, to the point where we were managing about 30, 35 properties full-time on, on Airbnb. And that went really well, really enjoyed that and kind of got got the experience of working with a bunch of real estate investors, seeing how how great the numbers looked and just being exposed to that. And then after a while, like Riley said, he and I connected. And for the longest time, I had I had, had all this experience with managing properties on short-term rental, but just had never actually bought a property. And that the whole process of going through and actually buying, getting financing, like analyzing a deal, all that was totally foreign to me. And so I'd always been really interested in it because I saw how much money these investors were making and I saw how how kind of well set up I would be to just buy a property and then manage it because obviously all the management systems we already had in place. And then Riley, on the other hand, had all the experience in actually buying and doing all these different creative financing strategies. He kind of knew it all like the back of his hand. But on his end, he hadn't had the experience of managing a short-term rental property and everything that comes with that. So it ended up working out really, really well together. Honestly, we we just sat down. We were just kind of shooting the shit talking about it one time. And it came out that like I'd always wanted to buy but lacked the experience with with buying. And Riley had always wanted to get a short-term rental but lacked the experience with the short-term rental side of things. So it was kind of a match made in heaven there where we started buying. And so that was actually the first property I actually ever bought was a property with Riley that was a short-term rental. And then since, since then, we've gone on to expand and buy more short-term rental properties. It's interesting, James, that, that you got into the management of short-term rentals without really getting into the investment side of that. Like, explain that. Like, how did you come to become a short-term rental manager? And were you arbitraging or just managing for other people and making money purely as a manager? A little bit of both. So when, when we very first started out, it was rental arbitrage. We quickly got out of that because it's just a quite risky model as you grow it. And it's pretty capital intensive for for a business standpoint to grow a rental arbitrage business. So we started transitioning quite quickly into doing a percentage management fee model. And really the the motivation there is I I, I never really viewed it at all as investing. It was always a business, an active business that I was building. It's not like real estate investing where... You know, obviously, you're not building any any real long term equity. You're not reaping the benefit of appreciation. We're just really managing for other people, and that was because I I've always kind of been an entrepreneur. I've always worked for myself, and so that was a cool business that we just saw an opportunity. We got started into it. My very first client was just a personal friend, a personal connection. He had a condo downtown Toronto that he stayed at during the week, but then he went up to his cottage on every weekend. So we started renting that out for him on the weekends. And he was covering his rent. And so he then referred us to other to other property owners in Toronto. And we kind of grew up from there. That we got into just because we saw the opportunity. And I had previous experience in service-based businesses. And so knew I could I could do that quite well. And then it went well and it kind of snowballed from there. It's really interesting that both of your origin stories kind of contain that that the synergy that you found with other people. You know, James, you and Riley found synergy because he knew how to do the investment and, and acquisition side. You knew how to do the management side. And then Riley, your relationship with your your the the first gentleman who you who hired you and threw you into the fire as far as getting that university level and education. Do you, do you find in real estate that that happens often that you find those synergies and do you deliberately look for them or, or do they just sort of happen by, by circumstance? Yeah, I can speak from my experience. I would say the synergies have been everything. And if it wasn't for the people that, that I've met at like meetups and conferences and events, you know, some through podcasts, even it, it just, yeah, there's no way I'd have, the portfolio and just like the business that we have today. And it was just a matter of like getting out of the, <laughs> getting out of the, the living room, right. Getting off the coach, like going and actually going into the rooms and meeting the people in person and creating those, those relationships. The network really is everything. And it, I know it's a cliche saying, but it's like, it's cliche because it's, it's true in this case. And I would say, yeah, again, just, just a matter of like creating those, those good relationships, shaking hands in person, you know, Hey, phone calls and emails and, you know, Zoom calls work. They're not nearly as effective though as like those in-person meetings and getting into those rooms with the people. I know from experience here, like I've been trying to figure out a boutique hotel for a little while now because we're looking to buy one this year. 
it, it, it's taken me months to try to like figure out anything online because it's like a lot of this information is very well kept. They don't uh, they don't have many blog posts or YouTube videos or anything of that nature to educate you on boutique hotels. So we were actually able to track down like a conference here in Toronto a few a uh, few months back. And in like the matter of like the first hour I was there, I had two connections of people that actually, and we're looking to buy potentially Nova Scotia specifically, they had opportunities to buy an off-market boutique hotel in Nova Scotia. And we also had a mutual connection. And it was just like this eye-opener for me for sure to just understand a lot of this stuff, especially at a certain level, is behind closed doors. It's not found online. And so just make sure that you go behind those closed doors and you pay to get into the right rooms. And so, yeah, that's just been my, my experience for sure has been relationships are everything and just getting into those rooms is key. James, your take on that. Yeah, I, I'd honestly echo a lot of what Riley said there. I think that relationships throughout business or investing, like whatever it is, I, I just find that it's incredibly helpful because there's there's always there's always not just someone, there's always just, you know, tons of people out there that have more experience than we do in any given area of, of business or real estate investing. And especially when it comes to real estate investing, because you know, you're you're investing your own money. You're investing money that you worked really hard for. So if you go and, and learn everything, I've gone and made the mistake of learning through trial and error before, and it costs a whole lot more. It's a lot more painful. I want to meet the people that have already been there, done that, made the mistakes and learn from their battle scars as opposed to having to get my battle scars. And so to your point, like synergy is a really important factor there, because if we're going to go and do that, we need to have something of value to provide to those people, right? It can't just be a one-way exchange. So I think I personally am always looking for people that we can learn from. And then, hey, how can we provide value to them? And sometimes that's just giving them money because you know they're they're way farther ahead, and so we're joining their mastermind, joining their their consulting, their coaching. Sometimes it's it's a really nice synergy where we can you know partner up on a business together, like Riley and I have. Sometimes it's a and it's, it's an exchange of labor, like with Riley and and his mentor early on, where Riley you know was was putting in the sweat equity and learning along the way. There's all kinds of different ways that it can that it can kind of shape up, but those relationships and those synergies are are definitely something we're always looking for. James, your advisor to Robert Kiyosaki when it comes to short-term rentals, what that's an interesting relationship. Tell us about that. So that kind of started from the from the book. Airbnb for Dummies kind of got our name out there. I have another business called Learn BNB that I got involved with after a couple of years of of managing properties on Airbnb. And so my business partner in that in that business is named Simon. And he and I basically run this blog, Learn BNB, and then we got contacted by Wiley. They wanted us to write the book on, on Airbnb hosting and whatnot. And so we wrote Airbnb for Dummies a few years back. And then from that, we ended up getting reached out to by Robert Kiyosaki and their team. They wanted to learn more about short-term rental investing. Obviously, everybody knows Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he's big on real estate investing. But he's always looking for new strategies and new ways to make money in real estate. And so they they had obviously, like a lot of people have, heard about short-term rentals, heard about this new kind of play that you could build into your overall real estate portfolio, and they wanted to learn about it. So seeing that we were the authors of, of Area for Dummies, they basically reached out and said, hey, we want to we want to learn from you guys. And so we worked with their team, kind of trained them and educated them on, on short-term rentals, and, and then went on to, we kind of partnered with them, and we worked with their, their audience to help teach them again about short-term rentals. And so that's sort of, sort of how that all shaped up. Riley, you you brought up Airbnb or boutique hotels, and I have to go back to that because I'm actually building out an Airbnb boutique hotel in Muskegon, Michigan. So I'm wondering, what's the, the questions you had there? Like, what were you trying to learn about that model? Because it's very similar to just the Airbnb model. Mainly, it's the extra expenses. And so like we're, we're looking for something likely between the range of 10 rooms and 50 rooms. And so at scale, we want to be able to have like a, a, a lobby with a concierge desk. And so that means that there's going to be someone behind that desk. And so what does that salary look like? And then do we have a maintenance team working directly for the corporation or for the GPLP, like for the boutique hotel? Or is it that we subcontracted and bring in another company that is a cleaning company? And then the maintenance team as well, Do they are they employed or contractors of the corp? Or is it again, contracted in, but by a different company? And just, just you know, there, there's a lot of other things as well when it comes to just buying a commercial property. When you need to do your your environmental phase one, potentially phase two, and just all these other hidden costs that we're just trying to understand, it's not that much different. You're right than like a nice short term rental, though. When when we're buying a cottage in 
<laughs> the course of lakes and it's a six bed you know two bath cottage it's a bit different than like a 50 room hotel so just trying to figure out the nuances and the differences between what we're currently doing and we have really good systems obviously and like you make make a living out of those systems too because we're so good at them but not all of them will naturally cross over into this boutique hotel so that's the biggest thing I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. It's interesting that if you're looking at a 50 door or bigger hotel, it does seem like you'd want to have like staff on site, you're cleaning people on site, or at least, you know, for certain hours of the day, the one we're building out is eight doors. So it's, it's run like an Airbnb, but what makes a 50 door hotel, a boutique hotel, what gives it that boutique moniker? So boutiques, anything under it's well, 99 rooms or less. So as soon as you hit a hundred rooms, then it turns into like an actual hotel, like your best Westerns, Hilton's, Marriott's, things like that. So, but 99 rooms and, and under down to five rooms. Five traditionally in Canada tends to be the commercial cutoff between residential and commercial. And as soon as you pop into commercial, then you're in that kind of boutique hotel realm. So technically like five to about 99 rooms would be a boutique. You both are in Canada, correct? Yeah. So correct. are you yeah. experiencing some of the same factors that we're experiencing right now, which would be higher inflation, higher interest rates, a lending environment is really tightened up. Is that happening in Canada as well? Yeah, we're we're getting we're experiencing all the same stuff. Like our our mortgage rates are going up, inflation's kind of uh, quite similar. So it's not it's not exactly the same, but certainly on a on a macro scale, we're experiencing a lot of the same stuff that the people are in the U.S. as well. And how does that affect your perspective then on on what you're trying to achieve in real estate investing? What's your overall view on real estate investing in the market as it stands right now? I would say the biggest thing right now is just making sure that we factor in like the purchase price, like whatever we're buying it at, going down over time and making sure that we're accumulating or adding into the equation as well, maybe a few extra basis points when we're looking at the analysis. So for example, if we're going to do a burr, we're going to look at the after repair value going down maybe a certain amount than what it currently would be. So if we're looking at the ARV right now today, well, in six months from now, if interest rates were to rise more and, and the market were to fluctuate, what could that potential ARV look like? Well, it might be lower than it is today. So let, let's let's put that into the equation. So that's the one thing that we're doing where the market is softening and turning down. The other thing as well is just to get in the equation, like in the analysis, just just you know, uh, making sure you're mitigating your downside the, the best you can. And being conservative is like what James and I always like to say. So if we have to increase the interest rate, say we can get 6.5% today, maybe we're actually going to put into the equation a 7% interest to just prepare for maybe the worst over the next six months to a year. Yeah. So, so that's the biggest thing, you know, when, when we were running analysis back, back at two years ago and the interest was one and a half percent or 2%, I'd be putting in like an extra, you know, interest rate, like, like at least a half an interest percentage or like one whole interest percentage to just prepare for a bit more. Little did I know it would go up four or five interest uh, percentages, but you know, Hey, like you, you can only prepare for so much, right? Cause you also don't want to throw off the numbers by a lot, but it's always about mitigating that downside and just being conservative. So the other thing that we're looking at is multiple plans. So we always like to say, usually our plan right now is plan A is a short-term rental. And then if, if 
there is licensing and regulation in place so the market shifts and just doesn't allow for short-term rentals to be that effective. Can we pivot easily into a plan B being medium term? And then as well, like if the market just doesn't sustain that, can we pivot again into long terms as a plan C? So that's usually the way that we set it up in mul- having multiple plans. Ultimately, also, like the other thing here is buying at just a, a reasonable price because a lot of the money is made on the buy. So if we can save realtor commissions and buy off market, say 5% realtor commissions and, and not be in like a bidding war and just go directly to the seller, we can usually save 5 to 10% off of what the fair market price is. And so that's a nice cushion in case the market were to come down 5 or 10%, then we have that extra kind of built-in equity right from the purchase. So all those things come into play to, to be able to weather the storm in an up market, a down market, like a sideways market. What is the plan? Like, what are you both trying to achieve together? Is it in the short-term rental space and building that portfolio, buying as many properties as you can to put in that portfolio? I mean, what's the goal for both of you? Right now, we're really excited about the boutique hotel. That's kind of the next big project that we're going to be taking on the investing side. Uh, I think I'll speak for both of us. Uh, I'll certainly speak for myself in saying that like, it's really exciting for us to learn about, about new stuff in the, in the real estate investing space. So we're always excited to, to go and take on new projects where we, they're kind of leveling up. We don't want to go and bite off something that's completely foreign to us that we have no business doing, but we always like to kind of take our, our skill set, you know, master it and then expand it a little bit, see, see what we can do. And so the boutique hotel for us, like we've, we've really mastered the, the fundamentals of running a short-term rental. And so the boutique hotel is like this natural next step where there's certainly some gaps in learning where we're going to need to learn a, a few new things in order to, to pull it off successfully. But it's still really in our wheelhouse. It's still something we feel really confident in. So that's the next big project that we're really excited about. And then obviously on the other side of that, we have our education company where we're helping people to, to replicate the results in the systems that we have. So that's kind of the, the main focus for us over the next few years. Let's dig into that a little bit. Like why a boutique hotel? Financially, if you when you look at the numbers, what separates a boutique hotel from just a regular hotel or just building out your Airbnb portfolio, your vacation rental portfolio? What has driven you to want to find that boutique hotel? So we've we've done quite a few Airbnbs at this point, it's safe to say, and, and, and many of them are like single families. We have a few multifamilies, but they're residential. And so the challenge is like if we were to go out and buy, you know, ten more properties, that's that's a lot to, to do. Like, there's no economies of scale when we do that. Even if we buy them close by, that's still like a lot of offers. That's still a lot of like negotiating. That's that's a lot of renovation management, and so it just doesn't scale that well. And so we're we're thinking like, how do we scale? Because what we're doing right now, we can't really scale to the to the level that we have or that we'd like to go to based on our goals. And so that's why singles and duplexes and triplexes just don't make sense. And so, yeah, like looking at that on the on the flip side, why don't we do like a Hilton or Marriott? It's just too expensive, I think is what it comes down to. A lot of them are like 50 million to 150 million. There, it's just too much because you're buying the brand too. You're buying the name. It's kind of like a franchise method. And so we're, we're just, that that's like to James's point, just a bit too far past our comfort zone, just a bit too far past our capability right now. But I think the boutique hotel is like a night, it's, it's the next best step. Um, it's like a milestone where we can just go past our comfort zone, but not so far that the plate cracks and we just can't handle it. So that's why, like, would we go and buy like maybe a hotel in the future? Possibly. But I think we'd need to do a couple of boutique hotels first. Have you identified the property or are you looking for the property? And how do you find those properties that are suitable with like 50 to 100 doors? Because I can't imagine they're just, you know, in every city. It, it's probably a very specific type of property you're looking for. So we actually have a, our, our team right now just doing a deep dive online and, and finding every single boutique hotel that exists because a lot of these things aren't sold on the market. They don't come on the market often even. And so you really have to reach out to the seller. So we have certain strategies to actually get into contact with the seller and like the owner of the property. So like in Nova Scotia, for example, we have just this massive spreadsheet with like every single boutique hotel that exists and the amount of beds, the pricing that we could find on their website. Like it just goes on from there. It's very, very detailed, like lots of different things that we're tracking. And so we just have this massive spreadsheet and then we're getting into contact with the owners of these boutique hotels. And so we're doing the same thing here in Ontario. Ontario is obviously quite a bit bigger than Nova Scotia. So we have a a longer list there being created, but that's been the best way is just to go make this, this massive list of like all of them. 
and then to get get into contact with the ones that fall within the, the range that we're looking for. A lot of that information is actually found online, so it's not that difficult. It just takes take takes some time, right? The other thing about boutique hotels is like they actually have websites. So when I was doing multi multifamily residential long term rentals, there was properties on the websites, but we can search hotel in Toronto, and there's a whole list right on Google search of the of the hotels that exist. And so it's much easier to find them than like doing Google Street View or going driving cities or driving <laughs> driving the streets and making a little less. That's what we used to do with the long term rentals, right? Is like drive the city, do the drive by search, and have a one person in the passenger seat taking out notes on their laptop for all the addresses, and then the other person's driving the street. So that was that was quite a bit more time consuming, you can say, and and not as scalable as like just having a virtual assistant to go online on Google search and find the whole list of boutique hotels. So what is the value proposition of a boutique hotel? Like how do you take one down and then go in and add value to to where you can you can exponentially increase your profit? Honestly, for a lot of the, the boutique hotels, like it depends on what your what your starting point is. But for a lot of them, it really is just modernizing the way that they're that they're attracting clients and and taking all the strategies that we've developed for running our short term rental business and then just applying them to this hotel. So I'll give an example is like if you if you go to a typical mom and pop small boutique hotel, you're going to find that they've got an old website. It's kind of clunky, pretty hard to find, doesn't inspire a lot of trust for people that are used to using big booking platforms like Airbnb or booking.com. And you've got to kind of search and find it. You've got to know what you're looking for. A lot of the time it's through word of mouth that someone, you know, locally there tells you, oh, hey, this is a really nice hotel to stay at. And you go and it's it's a, a generally good experience. And obviously that's there's a lot of variance there. Like you can have some hotels that they do an incredible job of, of hosting people and having a beautiful, clean place to stay, but they just don't do the marketing well. And you can also have sort of the, the people that don't do well on either front and they don't do a great job marketing. And it's also kind of a subpar place to stay. But as far as like really adding value, it's it's number one, making sure that, that stay is up to par, that the rooms are clean, they're modern, they're updated. It's a place that people want to stay and want to come back to. And then number two is just modernizing all the marketing strategies. So you know, getting the properties listed on the the online travel agency, OTAs like Airbnb, booking.com, that kind of thing. Doing, you know, your typical like remarketing strategies. So collecting guest email addresses when they log into the Wi-Fi, for example. So you can then send them promotions to get them to come back or to have them refer their friends and their family. And as long as you can do that effectively and, and just increase demand, which generally is not that hard when you're when you're trying to improve upon someone who is using very old and kind of outdated strategies. That's going to be probably the biggest lever for increasing the overall profit on the on the property. We just bought a vacation rental property. It's got a number of of doors to it, and the, the previous owners weren't on Airbnb. They weren't on VRBO. As we record this, it's the first week of March. We've already just by going on Airbnb within two weeks have increased our March bookings by like forty five percent over what the the owners already had booked. And, you know, we've only owned it two weeks and we just put it up there. So if they're not leveraging those platforms, that is a great way to just add so much value right off uh, from the start. There's typically quite a bit of low hang fruit with these. And, and where did you say that property was located? North Carolina. Yeah, we see a lot of that in Florida. Like Florida is one of those markets where the vacation rental market is so it sort of got deeper roots than just Airbnb. So there's a lot of people with vacation homes down in Florida that you know get bookings through their vacation rental manager, and they're not listed on on Airbnb. They're not listed on Booking.com. So we see that a lot with our students that'll buy properties down in Florida. It's one where we see it time and time again. Like you know, it's a it's a property that's been doing forty thousand dollars in bookings year after year. Suddenly someone gets it in the right hands where where they're actually leveraging it and using the right marketing strategies, and now it's doing eighty thousand dollars a year. So. As we wrap it up, I have a question for each of you. I'll start with you, Riley. What is your favorite hack or app? I don't know. I, I've been using Deal Check quite a bit. I think that's that's one of my favorite apps right now for real estate investing specifically. So Deal Check, it's pretty good to like be able to pull a bunch of data online and then do a nice analysis. Spell that out for us. Is it Deal Check? Deal Check. Yeah. So it's just Deal and then the word Check, like C H E C K. Yeah, it, it, it's a fantastic app. There's also like, you know, you can, you can find it online too on your laptop, but there's an app for your phone too. So if you're on the, on the fly, you're trying to analyze something, you can just plug in the numbers and works really well. James, what's your favorite hacker app? 
I would have to say AirDNA. I don't know if uh, if all the listeners are familiar with it. It's basically a data mining website where you can go on and see the the performance of short term rental properties from all over the world. So you can look at your neighbor for a property you're looking to buy and see how much they're making, what their average nightly rate is, their occupancy rate. Go check out their listing. I find that just super super invaluable when it comes to analyzing short term rentals. Sounds AirDNA. How would our listeners find out more about both of you or get a hold of you? Probably the best way is just checking out our website, bnbinnercircle.com. You can connect with either Riley or myself just through social as well. Feel free to send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, what have you. But yeah, to learn more, get in touch, kind of check out some of our free content and whatnot, bnbinnercircle.com is a great place to go. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show to talk about just real estate investing and the short-term rental work that you're doing. And I didn't expect to talk about boutique hotels, but I really enjoyed that part of the conversation too. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Glad to be here. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.